to, the, to today's episode of Making Pivotal Change. And the podcast is really about companies and people who have been going down one path and for whatever reason, opportunity, risk, uh, challenges, have decided to shift their focus and needed to make those kinds of business pivots and really getting to the heart of what drove those decisions, what was in place that enabled those decisions, and, and how were those decisions executed. So uh, today's guest is Tiago Santana, and Tiago is the founder and CEO of Gray Group International. And Gray Group International is actually sort of pivoting the way to even think about some of the things that we do. Um, Tiago uh, calls Gray a growth, a growth collective, if I got that right. And a growth collective is something that's not a marketing agency, a sales agency. It's really a group focused on the four pillars of growth. And those are sales, marketing, employees, and technology. And if you think about growth, you need all four of those things to be aligned and focused together to really be able to stimulate growth. You know, marketing is a term that's been used in for forever, but it's really about something much bigger than marketing now. So, Tiago, I'd love it if, first off, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I'd love it if you'd expand on that a little bit because it's such a fascinating concept. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Scott. I'm excited to be here. And I think you have a really great uh, concept on your hands. I always like to believe that one of the best elements of a startup is the ability to pivot. And so when companies are able to do that effectively, that uh, can really change the game. But yeah, we run what we refer to as a growth collective. And a big reason for that is we believe that when companies are looking to grow, they need to unpack what happens in the buyer and customer's journey. And we can't think about growth only at the decision stage or when customers are ready to exchange money for a certain product or service. And so, yeah, we break down our work into five pillars. We have sales, which is the acquisition of more revenue. Marketing, which we measure by cost to acquire a profitable customer. The service side of things, so after you sell, what happens, right? How do you allow people to adopt and how do you service your customers and get NPS scores that really uh, showcase the level of work you do? The people pillar, which we track based on the employee net promoter score. So how do your people feel in your organization and how is that measured and reflected in the work that you do? And then lastly, technology. In today's time, a lot of people don't realize this, but the average business uses about 70 tools to run their business. And oftentimes tools are a way where people lose efficiency and profitability. And we help companies align those tools so that they can get ecosystems in place that allow them to be more profitable. And we call ourselves a growth collective because our job is to help companies build scalable systems that drive internal and external customers through a wow-worthy buyer and customer journey towards advocacy. So our big MO is that what really grows a business in 2020 and beyond is advocacy. When you get people to get to a place where they simply can't shut up about your business, what does that mean in the long term? And the impacts are pretty exponential. So again, thank you so much for having me. No, my pleasure. So when you started the business, did you start with this vision or is this an evolution? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually stumbled on this. And when we started, we started out as a HubSpot partner. And I started in an effort to help my previous company, which was an air conditioning company that I ran with my parents. And I learned about digital marketing and how to make money online. I'd like to believe the best thing that's ever happened to me was the day that I made my first dollar on the internet. And that really catalyzed into something much greater. But very quickly, I realized that this marketing agency model is broken. And it's also something that I didn't necessarily want to engage in, in how I built my business. I really had to take some time to question why I'm doing this in the first place and what I wanted to accomplish. And so it's taken some time for us to really get to where we are today. Today, we have a really strong emphasis on the sustainable development goals that the United Nations has laid out. So we like to believe that we help companies that do good win. And we use our systems of advocacy to build an ecosystem where we can really take on that growth collective model and really challenge what that even means. So unlike a lot of agencies, we're proud to partner with other agencies, other creatives, freelancers, other networks. We're incorporated in a couple countries and we're working really hard to create a global model to business growth. 
And right now, there's a lot to unpack about what that means in today's world. And um, we like to believe that we're in phase one. So phase one of GGI is that growth collective. But long term, we have a really beautiful vision that myself and the team are working towards. So uh, almost daily, things are changing and evolving. And yeah, it's definitely taken a, a, a process to get to where we are today. Yeah, what's been interesting, and you and I talked a couple weeks ago, for, you're one of the most fascinating people I've spoken to in a long time. And it seems like your entire life is a series of pivots, which I, I find interesting and is probably a whole nother conversation. But one, there's two different types of pivots that occur. There are companies that pivot within an industry or into a different industry. And there are companies who actually pivot an industry to focus differently than it does. And I certainly get the sense you live in the, the latter part of that. What's the big challenge in getting people to think, both employees and potential clients, different than what they've been learned or what they've, you know, been, what they've learned and been taught over time? You know, there's certain buckets and they work a certain way and you're basically blowing that up. Yeah, you know, I like to believe that a confused mind says no. And as a company, it's taken a lot of effort on our part to communicate our vision very clearly. And so we spend a lot of time creating assets internally. I, I like to think of it as internal marketing. And we create assets and processes and policies in such a way that help communicate what we believe. And what I've learned is that when you get people to share common belief systems, then you move in the same direction. Something that's really helped for us is we adopted a self-organization model referred to as holacracy. And that allows people to pretty much go as fast as they can in their own lane and really own certain domains. And even though we're a small team of eight people, it's allowed us to take radical ownership over the work we do. And we're scaling rapidly because the team feels a sense of responsibility over their share of what's going on. And there is a challenge involved when you're creating a visionary company that's pivoting an industry, because a big thing I always like to think of is a couple of years ago, not too long ago, if you were to be told to go in a stranger, go in a car with a stranger, that that stranger would take you anywhere you wanted, you'd probably <laughs> think that was too good to be true. And today right. we have several different ride sharing apps. And um, I think companies that are changing the world see the world differently and see the world a little bit ahead of its time and are creating products and services that adapt to the changes. I think our environment right now, not only in America, but throughout the entire world has tremendous pockets of opportunity. And I'm of the belief that entrepreneurship is a great avenue for people to create not only amazing change in their personal lives, but also systemic change. And how do we really allow that to happen on a fundamental level? And I think the agency world and the agency model has some serious opportunities. Um, not only that, one thing I'm really proud of is when you think of those opportunities, they happen at very different levels. So they can happen on the individual contributor level, um, for them to create their own level of autonomy within their own lives, but also on a grand scale, you know, creating these world companies that change the game uh, on, on a bigger level. So um, I think there's a couple different pieces to that, but ultimately for me, I think it boils down to one big thing and it's trust. Um, I've worked really hard with the team that I have um, next to me to develop a level of candor and trust in our relationships. A big part of our mission is that we have a foundation of purposeful work, trust, and enthusiasm. And when we do our work with those three things in mind, it allows us to focus more on what's right versus who's right. And so as we work through pivoting and challenging our ideas, there are many moments where people are confused or people see the world differently. And it requires some elbow grease, if you will, to uh, really put in the work to align ourselves to what we're doing and the common goal. So um, it doesn't come naturally, but if you build these uh, systems to develop trust, I think it's very rewarding for any organization. That's great. And, uh, you know, at the core of being able to make some of these pivots and a lot of the folks that I've spoken with, uh, both on this podcast and outside of it, team health is first and foremost the most important element of being able to execute a pivot like that. If you don't have really good team health and the ability to have those tough conversations and the ability to have that healthy debate, but then everybody getting on the same page and trusting each other to, to head in that one direction, it just doesn't work. Um, so it sounds like you really have focused on two things, if I could paraphrase. First off, having a clear vision that everybody's on the same page with. 
and then having the ability to execute, but also adapt it because you've got the team health in place to be able to have those conversations and pivot pretty quickly. Yeah, when we all want the same thing, it makes getting to our destination a bit easier. Yeah. What's been the biggest challenge? You know, I think there's been several learning lessons as a young entrepreneur that I've had to overcome. I think in the last 10 years, in a couple months, I'm going to be in my 10th year of a career, of a professional career. And it doesn't seem like much for a lot of people, but I've been taking a lot of time to reflect on that. And as a leader, I've had a lot of opportunities to uh, fail forward, if you will. And so I think a lot of times, sometimes the biggest challenge is ourselves. And for me, I always have this phrase, get out of your own way. And regardless of the issue at hand or the business challenge, um, at the end of the day, it boils down to changing my belief systems, changing how I perceive a certain situation, and then really working through first principles to unpack that situation so that I can get to what is right. Um, we are a self-funded company, and so we've had uh, you know, all sorts of challenges with making sure that we have resources to keep growing. Last year, we were really fortunate to grow too quickly. So we had too many customers mm -hmm. wanting to work with us. And that's such that's an amazing cool. problem to have. And I think if you were to ask me five years ago, I would have said, there is no such thing as growing too quickly. <laughs> and I definitely learned from that. And there's consequences, not only in terms of business and profits, but also in people. I've been very fortunate to learn from not only our current team members, but our past team members. I take a lot of time with people who have left our company and reflect on what went wrong. We are working on an alumni program so that we can continue to have good relationships with the people who come through our organization. But one thing I've learned is that regardless of the person, they always have something to teach you. And I've heard so often, you know, you gotta find the right people, you gotta find the right people. And it's all about the right people in the right seats. But what I've learned is that you sometimes have the right people in the right seats, but you're making them sit on a chair that isn't ready for them or making them sit on a chair that isn't clear. And when you have people in the seats, if you're not really giving them the foundation they need to grow, um, then regardless of what you do, you know, it's gonna be a struggle. So I've definitely had to learn the hard way in, in some areas, but you know, I think with, with anything, whether it be um, you know, GGI where we are today or some of these world leading companies, I think when we boil down the idea of innovation, at, at most fundamental levels, a lot of what innovators are doing or pioneers are doing is working through things for the first time. And through that, you're gonna have tremendous amounts of failure. And so I really look at the failures as small little wins. And recently I've been on a big winning streak and I find that no matter <laughs> what it is, there's a win. And yeah. you know, we've had tons of different elements that I would go back and say, man, if only I knew what I knew today, I'd probably do that a little differently. But even then, I don't know if maybe if I'd done it differently, maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. So I'm grateful for the struggle. Right. And I will tell you that, you know, you have that conversation for the rest of your career and the rest of your life. But the reality of it is the things that the, the mistakes that I've made have informed everything I do now. And had I not made them, I, I wouldn't be able to, to, to do what I do now. So uh, no question about that. Um, you know, one of the things that you can we talked and fascinating discussion, if, if anybody ever wants to reach out to Tiago, please do, because he's, he's awesome. You're a visionary, right? You really do see things other people don't. And one of the traits of a visionary is the desire to chase the bright, shiny object. But picking pivots means you pick really carefully and you pivot into place with real design. And, you, you know, of the hundred things that come up, you pick the three or four that are really going to make a difference. How do you discern of all the ideas that hit you and all the things that get you excited? These are the ones we're going to go after. Yeah, that's a really great question. I was having a discussion with a friend of mine about focus and where do we really establish that? And ultimately, as people, we go where the light is, right? And so where there's light will tend to gravitate there, but sometimes things are in the darkness and requires a little bit more searching. Ultimately, I think it boils down to great research and proper planning, really allowing you to assess the options but also really defining what focus looks like for your organization. I think for us, we've taken the time to break down the different stages of where we are. And we've broken it down into three phases. And by having that plan, it allows us still to have this tremendous ambition for something big and something uh, revolutionary, but also allows us to recognize the actionable steps that we need to take today to get the results that we're looking for. 
And I think it all boils down to, for me, in this balance of ambition, recognizing the compounding nature of action. So sometimes what I see happen is there are tons of ideas, but there's an inconsistent action towards any of them. And when you're consistently taking action over a long enough period of time, whether the winds are big or small, they will compound. And before you know it, business is like a snowball. And going down that snowball, uh, uh, not snowball, uh, an avalanche. So it starts as a snowball and very little by little, that snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Before you know it, you have this huge thing rolling down the mountain and all of a sudden an avalanche. And I think some companies today, I would argue companies like Facebook have an avalanche that maybe they don't even know how to handle or know, um, maybe they don't even want per se. I'd love to have a conversation with Mark and see what his perspectives are when companies grow at that level. But with that, you know, for a company who's just starting out, when you have these ideas and you have, um, you know, all these things you want to execute, I think really recognizing that it's going to compound and you got to be in the game, uh, as Simon Sinek says, the infinite game. And so that idea might be the best idea in the world, but if it's really going to be the best idea in the world, it'll come when it's time. So don't allow it to distract you. And uh, what I call the squirrel effect. Squirrel. Yep. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, really we, we're all victims of that one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So how, when you came up with the idea of Growth Collective mm -hmm. and you sort of first envisioned that and started to build a business versus where you sit now, how similar was your initial vision to what you've built to date? Radically different. I think a big thing that inspired was I started learning a, a lot more about what it takes to build what I'm going to refer to as a serious company with funding and investors and people involved. And I started learning about funds that were being put together for specific reasons. And I realized that when we're thinking about the fund structure and the VC model, these VCs are investing in companies very strategically within a vertical. And when thinking about that, there's a lot of similarities that are in place for a, a company that allows you to grow better. And so by understanding the gaps there, I realized that a lot of people in this space we're playing a small game and not really seeing the full opportunity. And it's amazing to service companies and to service customers in the way that we do. But at the end of all of it, there is a greater opportunity to make a bigger impact. And I've been an entrepreneur for as long as I remember. And I always like to ask myself why that is. And for me, it's two things. I believe that one of the greatest forms of human expression is creating through love and being inspired to create something amazing. But also, I believe that through entrepreneurship, we have the opportunity to make serious impact. And what I found myself getting into was after we built the business, we were making great money, but we weren't making tons of impact. And so that was the tipping point for me where we realized that we needed to go back to the drawing board or else sustainably, this wasn't going to work out because I wasn't necessarily feeling inspired. And I personally believe that what drives growth is inspiration. So um, that's the, the big moment where we really had to ask ourselves, why a growth collective? And that business model is one that exists. It's not something that we're completely, you know, creating ourselves, but it comes down to this idea that if you want to go fast, you can go alone. And so many companies feel like they have to do it alone. But the truth is, is if you want to go far, you are much better together. And for us, we really believe that. And how can we use that core value to integrate in everything that we do? And so far, it's been pretty exciting and really rewarding. That's great. And it sounds like you've actually taken that core vision and really used that as a lens to figure out where do you want to go and where don't you want to go? Absolutely. I think when you have core values that you can hire and fire on, it allows it to be the core functioning of everything you do. And absolutely, it's uh, something that um, at some times it's uh, pretty comforting in a way to know that having this approach allows us to see the big picture but as a young person sometimes it all feels so far away and one thing that a good friend of mine recently shared is a lot of us live our lives waiting to start our lives when the happy ending comes but what we forget is that the happy ending is the ending and so what's happening today and in the journey is so much more important than where you're going and for me, having that really strong reason to do what we do helps us make decisions that allow us to bring on the right partners, 
allows us to really draw the line when something doesn't serve our long-term mission, or if we're being paid great money to do something that we don't believe in, it allows right. us the courage to be able to say, hey, thank you so much, but this is just something that doesn't fit in what we're all about. And I think that's a lot of power in, uh, to have in, in this day and age. So I'm pretty- yeah, I've, I, It's really awesome. And it's awesome to see you really stick to those values. I, what I would call that is there are companies that grow by accident and companies that grow on purpose. You're growing on purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. Any advice you give? So it, it, as you think about businesses that don't necessarily have that sense of purpose or are trying to figure out where they should go, in maybe uh, a place that's either not that personally or professionally fulfilling in terms of growth. What are a couple of pieces of advice you'd give people to think through where should they go and, and how should they break the problem down? So many people spend more time planning vacation than they do planning their life. And I'm a big believer that if you're struggling to find your purpose or struggling to find the reason why you wake up in the morning, whether it be for your work or your personal life, I'm a believer that we're one person, so we have one life. There is no such thing as work and personal. You need to take the time to figure out what it is that you really want. And there's amazing people out there that have shared some uh, concepts about how to do that. Emily Hayward, which is someone that I really admire in the agency space, talks about the why test. And she essentially says, like, you have to ask why all the way until you get to fear of death. And once you start doing that, you really start to ask what's important. And once you identify what's important, then you start to allow that to be the catalyst for all your work. So my big recommendation and the thing that I would tell someone in that spot right now is to take the time. I find so many people say, well, I don't have time to do that, or I don't have time to document the vision of my company so that my people know where they're going. I don't have time to uh, create policies that make sense so that everyone feels healthy and supported. I don't have time to implement this system because uh, it's too costly or whatever it may be, my question then becomes, what are the consequences or what will it cost you if you do nothing? And yeah. oftentimes the lack of action is so much more detrimental than taking the action. So, um, you know, it's worth the investment. And I am a firm believer that so many companies are in business to make money. They don't think it's important, but those aren't the companies that we see uh, make the long-term global impact. And, you know, you really have to make a decision. What kind of business and what kind of life are you going to live? At the end of it, we have the years at the beginning of our life and the years at the end and only a tiny little dash between our years. And how you choose to live your dash is totally up to you. So radical responsibility all the way. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Uh, so, um, and Bob, I'm reading Dare to Lead. And one of the things that really struck me as you were talking is uh, something that I can't remember who she was quoting in the book, Renee Brown, but uh, she talks about meditation. And the quote was something to the effect of, you should meditate 30 minutes a day. And if you don't feel like you have the time to meditate 30 minutes a day, then you should meditate 60 minutes a day, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, it really is about taking the time to figure out where you're going and how you're going to get there and, and just making sure that you're thinking, not just doing. 100%. Couldn't agree more. So uh, one more question for you, and that's obviously you solve things in a unique way. You solve challenges that are unique. You work with a new, unique client set. So when you think about your ideal client for the Growth Collective, tell me about them. Yeah, we love to help people who do good win. And our ideal client is someone who's focused on solving one of the sustainable development goals. So we believe that this idea that doing good doesn't have to only be for nonprofits. We enjoy companies that are innovating and changing the game wherever it may be. So one of my favorite clients is a fintech company and they're really helping people make better investments and helping people gain more financial literacy and financial freedom. But ultimately, it boils down to the desire to work together. There's this thing that I don't love so much about the marketing world, that we are forced to do all the hard work, but don't get any of the credit. And sometimes what I've learned in the past is that some companies don't realize the collaboration that is required to do amazing work, to tap into audience desires, to really unpack what brand stands for and what that means for that specific business and the problems they solve. So for us, we're really interested in working with dynamic companies with a strong mission, with a strong focus on people, and then ultimately with a product that we also believe in. Because if we're spending as many hours and as much time of our day that we do on our partners, 
at the end of it, we want to believe in their, their product and their company more than they do because we want to help them innovate that growth. And so for us, we just have a criteria and a rubric uh, of, that we use internally for our growth advisors for them to check. Do they meet these criteria? And some of the criteria is, are they doing more good than they are harm? And for us, we really believe that's important, especially when it's more than just the dollar we make. So right now we work across several different industries, but ultimately we're looking for people who understand the methodology and what it takes to create customer advocates. Fantastic. Tiago, I want to thank you again. This has been amazing and quite frankly, inspirational. Uh, oh, it's it's, it's wonderful to see somebody who's got such a clear vision who is so willing to make the sacrifices and the decisions against that vision uh, to achieve it, and who has such a tremendous understanding of team health. So uh, I, I really appreciate you being on, and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you today. Thank you. Take care.